Behind the fortress-like walls of high-security prisons, the world's most dangerous criminals endure a chilling and intriguing life. While prisons are designed to hold individuals accountable for their actions and protect society, some prison cells have gained notoriety for their inhumane conditions. Join us as we uncover what secrets lie within these inhumane cells, and what does life look like for those who've fallen from grace. Morris Mumbucha in Canadian Supermax Maurice Mombauche's crimes and his central role in the Quebec Biker War represent a chilling chapter in Canadian criminal history. Born in 1953, Boucher initially joined the Hells Angels, one of the world's most notorious outlaw motorcycle clubs in the 1980s. His rise to prominence within the organization would ultimately set the stage for a violent and deadly conflict that would come to be known as the Quebec Biker War. The origins of the Quebec Biker War can be traced back to the lucrative drug trade, particularly the distribution of cocaine and other illicit substances. Bauche and his Hells Angels associates sought to control this profitable market in the province of Quebec, leading to intense rivalries with other criminal organizations, most notably the Rock Machine, a rival biker gang. Violence erupted in the early 1990s as both sides vied for dominance. Boucher, known for his charisma and ruthlessness, emerged as a key figure in orchestrating attacks and retaliations. These violent clashes involved bombings, shootings, and assassinations that sent shockwaves throughout Quebec. Innocent bystanders often fell victim to the crossfire, and the death toll climbed steadily. One of the most infamous incidents during the Quebec Biker War was the 1995 assassination of Daniel Desrochers, a correctional officer targeted for his alleged cooperation with authorities. This brazen act of violence further intensified the conflict and drew national attention to the growing menace of the warring biker gangs. As the violence escalated, law enforcement agencies launched extensive investigations to dismantle the criminal networks involved. Boucher was eventually arrested and faced many charges, including multiple counts of murder, drug trafficking and conspiracy. In 2002, he was convicted of first-degree murder for his role in the deaths of two correctional officers during the conflict. Maurice Mombaucher's imprisonment in the Canadian Supermax responded to his reign of terror and the need to neutralize his influence within the criminal underworld. Maurice Mombaucher's life in the Canadian Supermax starkly contrasts the freedom and power he once enjoyed as a prominent figure in the Quebec biker underworld. The Canadian Supermax is a maximum security facility that houses the country's most dangerous and high-profile criminals. Boucher's incarceration reflects the gravity of his crimes and the threat he poses to society. Inside the Canadian Supermax, Boucher leads a highly disciplined and controlled existence. Strict security measures and isolation from the general inmate population characterize his daily routine. He spends much of his time confined to a small, windowless cell with limited opportunities for social interaction or outdoor activities. Surveillance cameras monitor his every move, ensuring he poses no threat to others or attempts to orchestrate criminal activities within the prison walls. Inmates in the Supermax have restricted access to privileges and amenities available in other correctional facilities. Boucher's ability to communicate with the outside world is heavily monitored and restricted, making it challenging to maintain contact with his former criminal associates or exert influence beyond the prison's confines. Additionally, the staff at the Canadian Supermax are highly trained and vigilant, ensuring that Boucher and other inmates are under constant supervision. This level of security is crucial to preventing escapes, maintaining order, and safeguarding the lives of inmates and prison personnel. The bazooka attack on Maurice Mumbai is one of Canadian criminal history's most audacious and sensational incidents. It highlights the extent of Boucher's influence and the desperation of his associates and underscores the challenges authorities face in containing his criminal network. In 1997, Boucher was serving time at the Archambault Institution in saint anne des plaines Quebec, when a group of his loyal followers hatched a daring plan to liberate him from the confines of the prison. To execute this audacious jailbreak, they resorted to using a bazooka, a weapon generally associated with military combat rather than criminal activity. The daring attack involved firing a bazooka at the prison's fortified walls to breach its defenses and free Boucher. This extraordinary act of violence and the required level of planning left law enforcement and the public astounded. It showcased the lengths Boucher's criminal associates were willing to go in their determination to secure his release and perpetuate their criminal enterprises. Fortunately for the authorities, the attack did not succeed in freeing Boucher. The prison's robust security measures and swift law enforcement response prevented significant breaches. Nevertheless, the incident served as a stark reminder of the pervasive reach of organized crime and the dangerous capabilities of Boucher's network. In the aftermath of the failed bazooka attack, security around Boucher was further intensified. His incarceration became even more stringent, with heightened surveillance and isolation measures to mitigate future attempts at escape or acts of violence. The bazooka attack on Maurice Boucher remains a memorable episode in the annals of Canadian criminal history, a testament to the audacity of organized crime and a chilling reminder of the lengths to which criminals will go 
to protect their interests and their leaders, even behind the seemingly impenetrable walls of a maximum security prison. Richard Huckle in Full Sutton. Richard Huckle's crimes are a dark chapter in the history of child exploitation and online abuse. Huckle, a British national, traveled to Malaysia, where he posed as a Christian volunteer working in impoverished communities. On the surface, he appeared to be a caring individual, but a predator with sinister intentions lurked beneath this facade. Huckle's modus operandi involved gaining the trust of families in these communities, often targeting the most vulnerable. He exploited this trust to access their children, whom he subjected to sexual abuse. What makes his crimes even more disturbing is his meticulous record-keeping. Huckle documented his acts in explicit detail, amassing a trove of photographs and notes, which he then shared on the dark web. The discovery of Huckle's crimes was a harrowing revelation. Authorities stumbled upon his activities when they arrested him at Gatwick Airport in 2014. His encrypted computer files contained over 20,000 indecent images of children and a ledger detailing the abuse of nearly 200 children over several years. His actions' sheer scale and depravity sent shockwaves not only through the United Kingdom but across the globe. Huckle's case underscored the alarming reality of online child exploitation. It demonstrated how predators can use the anonymity of the internet to perpetrate heinous crimes and maintain a sinister online presence, making detection incredibly challenging. The case also ignited discussions about the safety of children, both online and in vulnerable communities worldwide. It raised important questions about the responsibility of tech companies, law enforcement agencies, and society in protecting children from such predators. Furthermore, the international nature of Huckle's Huckle's crimes posed legal and jurisdictional challenges. It prompted calls for greater cooperation between countries to combat child exploitation, as offenders often exploit legal loopholes and differences in legislation to evade justice. In June 2016, Richard Huckle was convicted of 71 offenses involving 22 children, though it is believed that the actual number of victims could be much higher. The gravity of his crimes was reflected in the sentencing. He received 22 life sentences with a minimum term of 25 years before he could even be considered for parole. This was an unprecedented sentence for crimes of this nature in the UK, highlighting the seriousness with which the legal system treated his case. Huckle was incarcerated at Full Sutton Prison, a maximum security facility in Yorkshire, England. This prison houses some of the country's most dangerous and high-profile offenders. The choice of Full Sutton for Huckle's imprisonment reflects the gravity of his crimes and the need to ensure his safety, given the potential threat from other inmates who might seek revenge for his despicable acts against children. HMP, Full Sutton, nestled in the picture picturesque countryside of Yorkshire is a maximum security prison known for housing some of the United Kingdom's most notorious inmates. It's a place where the concept of rehabilitation often takes a back seat to the necessity of maintaining strict security measures. Inside these imposing walls, inmates and staff face an environment where fear and violence cast a long shadow. Richard Huckle's presence in the facility only adds to the complex dynamics. The entire Sutton prison is no stranger to high-profile inmates. Men like Charles Bronson, Lee Duffy and Dale Cregan have all called it home at various times. Their notoriety and histories of violence make Full Sutton a challenging environment to manage. These inmates often bring a reputation that can trigger power struggles and turf wars behind bars. Huckle's presence within the prison walls brought its own set of challenges. Other inmates, even those convicted of violent offenses, often view pedophiles with disdain, and prison authorities had to ensure Huckle's safety while maintaining order. Given the nature of his crimes, Huckle would likely have been kept in protective custody or some form of segregation to ensure his safety. Inmates with child exploitation or abuse charges often face threats or violence from other prisoners who seek to harm them. This isolation, while meant to protect Huckle, could also have had detrimental effects on his mental well-being due to prolonged periods of isolation. Strict security measures govern life inside Full Sutton. High walls, razor wire, and advanced surveillance systems are the physical barriers to escape, but the social dynamics often prove most challenging. Inmates here are frequently subjected to stringent routines, limited privileges, and a lack of personal space. This can create an atmosphere atmosphere ripe for tension and conflict. Reports of violence within Full Sutton Prison have increased, prompting concern among inmates and staff. It's an environment where even correctional officers have sometimes admitted to fearing for their lives. The tensions among inmates, exacerbated by the presence of high-profile offenders, have led to clashes, gang affiliations, and territorial disputes. Liam Dean in HMP Leeds. The tragic story of Liam Dean revolves around the heart-wrenching death of his two-day-old daughter, Luna. In 2017, Liam Dean was convicted of manslaughter, a conviction that led to his imprisonment at HMP Leeds Prison. To truly understand the gravity of this case, we must delve into the details surrounding his conviction, the legal proceedings that unfolded, and the sentence he received. The case began when Luna, a helpless newborn, suffered fatal injuries while under Liam Dean's care. This raises the question of how such a terrible incident could occur within the confines of a family home. The following investigation 
Foundation unearthed disturbing evidence of abuse and violence against the defenseless infant. The prosecution argued that Dean's actions directly led to Luna's tragic and untimely death, a claim that the jury ultimately accepted. The legal proceedings that followed were a critical chapter in this harrowing tale. Liam Dean stood before a court of law where he faced the allegations of manslaughter. His defense team likely sought to establish a defense, possibly arguing issues such as intent, negligence, or mental health concerns. On the other hand, the prosecution presented evidence that demonstrated a direct link between Dean's actions and Luna's death. The courtroom became a battleground of legal arguments, emotional testimonies, and proof that would ultimately decide Dean's fate. Upon conviction, Liam Dean received a sentence reflecting his crime's gravity. While the exact duration of his imprisonment may vary, it undoubtedly serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of his actions. His incarceration in HMP Leeds Prison, a high-security facility, underscores society's commitment to holding individuals accountable for their actions, especially when they involve the most vulnerable among us. Life inside HMP Leeds, where Liam Dean is serving his sentence, vastly differs from what most of us experience daily. It's a place where structure and routine are paramount, starkly contrasting the outside world's freedom and unpredictability. In this confined environment, each day follows a carefully choreographed performance. Inmates like Dean typically start their day early, waking up at dawn. This early start is not a mere choice, it's a mandatory part of the prison's regimen. The day begins with a roll call to ensure all inmates are present and accounted for. After roll call, breakfast is served, and it's usually a simple, no-frills meal. Prisons prioritize efficiency, so breakfast tends to be a quick affair. Inmates are then assigned various tasks and activities to keep them occupied and contribute to the prison's daily functioning. These tasks can range from kitchen duty to cleaning common areas or working in the prison's workshops, where inmates might engage in tasks like woodworking or sewing. For Liam Dean and others, these responsibilities offer a sense of purpose and help maintain the prison's cleanliness and order. In the afternoon, inmates usually have some free time for exercise or recreation. This could involve using the prison's gym facilities, playing sports in designated areas, or simply spending time in their cells reading or reflecting. However, this free time is constantly monitored and regulated to ensure safety and security. However, considering there have been 11 deaths at Leeds Prison since May 2013, the second worst number of prison fatalities in the country, life inside HMP Leeds for Liam Dean is undoubtedly fraught with challenges and dangers that are a far cry from the freedoms of the outside world. Prisons are environments that carry unique perils, both for those incarcerated and those working within the system. Understanding the hazards that Liam Dean may face during his imprisonment sheds light on the complexities and difficulties of life behind bars. One of the foremost dangers within prison walls is the potential for violence. Prisons often house individuals with histories of criminal behavior, and tensions can run high. These tensions can erupt into physical altercations, fights, and gang-related violence. For Liam Dean, being in the presence of fellow inmates who may hold solid grudges or grievances could seriously threaten his safety. Moreover, the risk of violence isn't limited to interactions with other inmates. Prison staff often have the unenviable task of maintaining order and security, and incidents of abuse or mistreatment can occur. While strict protocols and oversight are in place to prevent such abuses, they can still happen, leading to a sense of vulnerability for inmates like Dean. Mental health is another pressing concern within the prison system. The isolation, confinement, and lack of personal autonomy can severely affect an individual's mental well-being. For Liam Dean, the guilt and remorse he may feel for his actions, combined with the isolation from his family and society, can contribute to depression and anxiety. Access to mental health support in prison can be limited, making it difficult for inmates to cope with the emotional challenges they face. Additionally, the potential for contraband and substance abuse is a looming threat. Prisons often struggle to prevent the smuggling of drugs, weapons, and other prohibited items. Inmates may be coerced into illicit activities, leading to further complications and risks, including disciplinary actions. The overall living conditions in prisons like HMP Leeds can also be hazardous. Overcrowding, inadequate healthcare, and limited access to education or vocational training can create an environment that fosters frustration and despair, potentially leading to unrest among the inmate population. Sergey Walton at Illinois Federal Prisons Sergei Walton, a name that struck fear into the hearts of many, was not just another criminal. He was a figure of infamy in organized crime. His criminal profile paints a picture of a dangerous individual whose actions and associations sent shockwaves through law enforcement agencies and communities. At the heart of Sergei Walton's criminal career was his leadership within the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. As the former president of the Oakland, California chapter, Walton was deeply entrenched in a world of violence, criminal enterprises, and a strict code of loyalty. This affiliation with one 
one of the most notorious biker gangs in history spoke volumes about his willingness to engage in criminal activities with a blatant disregard for the law. One of the most damning aspects of Sergei Walton's criminal record was his involvement in a RICO, Racketeer-Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act case. This federal charge is typically reserved for individuals involved in organized criminal enterprises, illustrating the depth of his engagement in criminal conspiracies. Although Walton managed to beat these RICO charges, he could not escape the shadow of his criminal past. However, it was his conviction for the possession of an illegal machine gun that ultimately sealed his fate. This conviction underscored his criminal proclivities and his comfort with using firearms, a chilling detail that marked him as a potentially dangerous figure. Moreover, Sergei Walton's history was marred by numerous murder investigations. While he may not have been convicted of these crimes, his being a prime suspect in multiple murder cases speaks to his involvement in violent and deadly activities. In the eyes of law enforcement, Sergei Walton embodied the essence of a dangerous criminal. His high-ranking position within the Hells Angels, involvement in organized crime, firearms possession, and connections to murder investigations all pointed to a man who posed a significant threat to society. Sergei Walton's escape from a county jail just before his scheduled transfer to a federal prison in Illinois raised eyebrows and cast a spotlight on the security measures within county jails. To truly grasp the gravity of the situation, let's examine the circumstances surrounding his escape. County jails are typically facilities where individuals awaiting trial or serving short sentences are detained. These jails are a crucial part of the criminal justice system, temporarily holding place until more permanent arrangements can be made. However, the level of security within county jails can vary widely. Some are well equipped with modern security measures, while others may need updated infrastructure that poses security risks. In Sergei Walton's case, his successful escape from County Jail 2 in San Francisco in 1981 implied that there may have been some lapses or vulnerabilities within the county jail's security apparatus. It raised questions about how he managed to elude authorities, whether there were any inside collaborators, and whether the facility had adequate surveillance and staff to prevent such incidents. This escape occurred amidst a backdrop of heightened security due to the presence of high-profile inmates, including members of the notorious Hells Angels biker gang. County Jail 2, situated on the seventh floor of the Hall of Justice, was considered a high-security facility at the time. However, the escape of 13 prisoners, including Sergei Walton, raised questions about the efficacy of the jail's security measures. Escapes from county jails are relatively rare but not unheard of. Inmates may attempt to flee for various reasons, such as avoiding transfer to a higher security facility or wanting to evade justice altogether. The circumstances surrounding Sergei Walton's escape provide a stark reminder of the challenges law enforcement and corrections officers face in maintaining secure custody within county jails and highlight the importance of continuous evaluation and improvement of security protocols. But how dangerous were federal prisons in Illinois before 1981 that Sergei Walton opted to escape? These facilities were known for stringent security protocols and often housed hazardous inmates. Metropolitan Correctional Center Chicago, Chicago MCC. Located in Chicago, Chicago MCC was designed as an administrative level federal prison. It held both men and women of all security levels, particularly those with trials pending in the Northern District of Illinois and offenders serving short sentences. Despite its relatively modern facilities, it was still a place where high-profile inmates faced the challenges of pre-trial detention, making it a potentially dangerous environment. United States Penitentiary Marion, Marion USP. In Southern Illinois, Marion USP was initially designed to replace the infamous Alcatraz prison in California. It was the first control unit facility, meaning it strictly limited inmate contact to maintain order among violent offenders. This stringent approach highlighted the potential dangers within the prison system, particularly for inmates who couldn't conform to strict rules. Sergei Walton's desire to avoid a federal prison in Illinois can be understood in the context of these high security institutions. These prisons were known for their strict rules, limited inmate contact, and the presence of violent offenders. In Sergei Walton's case, his escape from a county jail, followed by his transfer to a federal prison, may have been driven by a desire to evade the dangers and challenges posed by these institutions. His background as a former leader of the Hells Angels and his criminal history likely made him a target within the prison system, escaping an appealing option, even if it meant facing legal consequences afterward. Despite his cunning escape, Sergei Walton's criminal pursuits eventually caught up with him. He was convicted in a federal organized crime case, resulting in a prison sentence. However, Walton later became an informant for federal government prosecutors, leading to his entry into the witness protection program and a secret relocation. His life ended on October 19, 2006, at 62, while residing in Sacramento. Emma Coronel Aspuro at FMC Carswell.
In February 2021, Emma Coronel Espuro found herself in the spotlight when she was apprehended at Dulles International Airport near Washington, D.C. Her arrest sent shockwaves through the international community as it marked a significant development in the ongoing battle against drug cartels, particularly the Sinaloa cartel. The reason for Emma's stay at FMC Carswell, a federal medical center located in Fort Worth, Texas, was not a matter of convenience, but rather a necessity. It was due to her specific medical needs that she was housed in this facility. You see, FMC Carswell is not your typical prison. It's primarily designed to cater to female inmates who require medical attention, whether for physical or mental health conditions. Emma Coronel Espuro's situation was not uncommon at FMC Carswell. This federal facility specializes in providing medical care and support to female inmates suffering from various health concerns. This includes chronic illnesses, mental health disorders, or pregnancy-related care. It's crucial to understand that the prison system recognizes the importance of providing appropriate medical care to inmates, ensuring their well-being while serving their sentence. Sentences. In Emma's case, her stay at FMC Carswell was in line with this principle. Her specific medical requirements necessitated a facility like FMC Carswell, equipped with the resources and expertise to address her health needs while ensuring her security and confinement. This underscores the complexities involved in managing high-profile inmates like Emma Cornell Aspuro, where medical considerations must be carefully balanced with the demands of incarceration. Emma Cornell Aspuro's role in the Sinaloa cartel was far more significant than just being the wife of Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. She was, in many ways, his trusted confidant and an integral part of the cartel's operations. Emma Coronel was not just a passive observer in drug trafficking. She actively participated in various aspects of the cartel's functioning. One of the most prominent instances of her involvement was her alleged role in helping El Chapo escape from a high-security Mexican prison in 2015. El Chapo's escape was an audacious and daring act that involved a sophisticated tunnel dug beneath his cell. Emma Coronel was accused of playing a crucial part in orchestrating this escape. She allegedly coordinated the tunnel's construction, which extended for more than a mile and was equipped with lighting and ventilation systems. This operation demonstrated her intricate knowledge of the cartel's logistics and her ability to organize complex criminal endeavors. Furthermore, Emma Coronel was not just involved in the cartel's logistics. She was also a public face, using her beauty and social media presence to glamorize the criminal lifestyle. She often attended El Chapo's high-profile court hearings in the United States, drawing attention to the cartel's activities. Her role as El Chapo's wife afforded her a unique position within the organization. While El Chapo was imprisoned, she was privy to insider information, communicated messages on his behalf, and played a critical role in maintaining the cartel's operations. In addition to her involvement in the escape, Emma Coronel faced charges related to drug trafficking. She was accused of conspiring to distribute drugs, including cocaine, methamphetamine, and marijuana, into the United States. Her connection to the Sinaloa cartel's drug trade was evident, and these allegations further solidified her status as a critical player in the organization. Given her deep involvement in the cartel's activities, it became clear why Emma Coronel Aspero was imprisoned at FMC Carswell. The facility's medical infrastructure was necessary for her stay, as she reportedly required medical attention during her incarceration. Her arrest and subsequent imprisonment underscored the extent to which she was entangled in the criminal operations of the Sinaloa cartel, from aiding in daring prison escapes to facilitating the drug trade, all of which ultimately led her to FMC Carswell Prison. In Fort Worth, Texas, FMC Carswell is a federal medical center designed to cater to the specific needs of female inmates, particularly those requiring medical attention or mental health care. While it may not be categorized as a maximum security prison, it has seen its fair share of high-profile inmates and incidents over the years, making it a facility of significance within the federal prison system. One notable aspect of FMC Carswell is its role as a specialized institution. It primarily serves women with various medical conditions, such as chronic illnesses or mental health issues. This focus on medical care distinguishes it from other federal prisons and contributes to its unique inmate population. Due to its specialized nature, FMC Carswell has been chosen to house individuals involved in various criminal activities. These inmates may include those convicted of drug trafficking, white-collar crimes, espionage, and other offenses. The facility's medical capabilities suit inmates with complex health needs, irrespective of their criminal background. The presence of high-profile inmates at FMC Carswell can lead to distinctive challenges for the prison administration. These individuals individuals often require heightened security measures to prevent escape attempts or threats from other inmates. Therefore, the prison staff must balance the medical care and security requirements of these notable inmates while maintaining the safety and order of the facility. El Chapo at ADX Florence
Joaquin El Chapo Guzman's imprisonment at ADX Florence is a stark symbol of the United States' determination to bring one of the world's most notorious drug lords to justice. But why was El Chapo sent to this high security facility, and what factors led to this decision? First, it's essential to understand El Chapo's criminal history. Joaquin Guzman Loera, known as El Chapo, due to his short stature, was the mastermind behind the Sinaloa drug cartel, one of the world's most influential and dangerous criminal organizations. He was responsible for smuggling immense quantities of drugs, including including cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine into the United States, fueling addiction and violence nationwide. El Chapo's criminal record was marred by multiple prison escapes, making his incarceration a priority for U.S. law enforcement. He broke out of two Mexican prisons, including a daring escape through a tunnel in 2015. These incidents embarrassed Mexican authorities and raised serious concerns about his ability to manipulate the prison system. When El Chapo was captured in 2016 and subsequently extradited to the United States, the authorities had no intention of allowing him to escape again. This brings us to ADX Florence, also known as the Alcatraz of the Rockies. Several factors drove the decision to house El Chapo at this facility. ADX Florence is renowned for its stringent security measures. It was designed to incarcerate the most dangerous and high-profile criminals, and its isolated location in the Colorado wilderness makes escape nearly impossible. The prison's design includes features like high concrete walls, electronic surveillance, and extensive guard presence, ensuring inmates remain securely confined. Furthermore, ADX Florence employs a practice known as as administrative segregation, where inmates are placed in solitary confinement for 22 to 24 hours a day. This was considered a necessary precaution for El Chapo, given his history of orchestrating escapes and the fear that he could still influence the drug trade from behind bars. ADX Florence stands as an exemplar of high security incarceration in the United States. Nestled amidst the rugged terrain of Colorado, this federal supermax prison is designed to confine the most dangerous and escape-prone inmates. Its reputation for stringent security measures and isolation is well-deserved, making it a fitting choice for housing individuals like El Chapo. The fortress-like architecture of ADX Florence is the first line of defense against any potential breaches. Encircled by thick concrete walls and fortified with advanced surveillance systems, the prison is designed to deter escape attempts. This formidable exterior serves as a visual reminder of the level of security maintained within. The confines of the prison cells are stark and minimalistic, containing only the most necessities. Communication with other inmates is prohibited, and any interaction with prison staff is heavily monitored and controlled. This isolation is intended to prevent collaboration among inmates and deter any potential disruptions to the prison's order. Inmates at ADX Florence experience a profound absence of natural light. Their cells have minimal windows, restricting their exposure to the outside world. This lack of daylight contributes to disorientation and further reinforces the feeling of isolation. It's a deliberate measure aimed at minimizing any semblance of normalcy and maintaining a constant state of control. Additionally, the sensory deprivation within ADX Florence is profound. Inmates have limited access to auditory and visual stimuli, further intensifying their isolation. The absence of external noise and the monotony of the prison environment can lead to a disorienting and psychologically taxing experience for those incarcerated. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman's imprisonment at ADX Florence has not been without its fair share of challenges and controversies. While the prison's high security measures are intended to prevent escapes and maintain public safety, they have sparked debates about the treatment of inmates and the ethics of long-term solitary confinement. One of the primary concerns raised is the impact of solitary confinement on El Chapo's mental health. ADX Florence is notorious for its strict solitary confinement policies, where inmates spend up to 23 hours a day alone in their cells with minimal human interaction. Extended periods of isolation can lead to severe psychological effects, such as depression, anxiety, and hallucinations. Critics argue that such conditions may constitute cruel and unusual punishment, which the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution prohibits. The controversies surrounding El Chapo's imprisonment extend beyond his well-being. They also touch on broader questions about using solitary confinement in the U.S. criminal justice system. Advocates for prison reform argue that long-term isolation should be reserved for the most dangerous inmates and used sparingly due to its potential for psychological harm. They contend that it is overused in the U.S. and that alternative methods of punishment and rehabilitation should be explored. So, what motivates such individuals to embrace a life of crime and in some cases make daring escapes to avoid the consequences of their actions? Click on the card showing on your screen for more interesting videos like this.